We still got three minutes, folks. So what do you want to talk about? <laughs> oh, I'll tell you what we can talk about while we're waiting. Um, uh, today, as I mentioned at the eight o'clock service, so those of you who are God, really good of you, I tell you what, to get here at eight o'clock on a normal Sunday is a, is a beautiful thing. To get here on an eight eight o'clock after daylight saving time shifted. That's commendable. <laughs> so, well done. So you too. Thank you. Yeah. Although you notice I let Gay preach this morning. I got smart. to sleep in a little bit. That was smart. I came wandering. What time did I come wandering in? About 7.45. So it wasn't quite that late. But it was, you know, I came wandering in later than I do on a typical Sunday. Um, so thank you, Gay, for letting me get a night's nice sleep last night. Um, and for the sermon, too. I'm sorry. Yes, and for the sermon, too. <laughs> Um, today, as I mentioned at 8 o'clock, and I'll probably repeat myself in the 10-15 service, uh, today is, Bart, by the way, for what little that's worth, if you hate this, you're not alone. Um, Barb thinks this is silly, my, my Barb. She thinks this is silly that we do this mid-Lent break in the routines, and we wear pink vestments, and it's Mothering Sunday, and Refreshment Sunday, and Mid-Lent Sunday, and it's like, if you're going to do Lent, do Lent, and if you're not, don't. But don't just pretend you're doing Lent and then say, oh, but not today. So, <laughs> Recess. <laughs> she says, that's just silly. But, you know, that's what we do. Um, so there you have it. Uh, if you think it's silly, you're not alone. Um, go ahead and make fun, but, but we're doing it anyhow. Um, so it's, it's Mothering Sunday, Mid-Lent Sunday, Refreshment Sunday, Latare Sunday. What names have I forgotten? Those are the main ones that come to mind. Um, it actually is a, a fairly ancient um, tradition, although this is where Barb has a, a valid point. Once upon a time, Lent was a lot more than it is now. And uh, you know the way we all do Lent in 21st century America is not the way they used to do Lent. And, and it seems more fair that they gave themselves a break back in days gone by than we perhaps need. Nevertheless, we carry on some traditions, even so. Um, and of course, in England, it, uh, it's really a, a classist thing, because I think at least part of the reason for Mothering Sunday was to give staff a chance to get one, one day off before Holy Week and Easter, and they had to work extra hard for the, for the, the gentry to pull off the, uh, the parties and such that would be expected around Easter. Anyhow. Um, but we still, we still do it because it's, you know, whatever. Um, it's, so it's all those things. And here at Trinity, uh, I decided just, just this past week that it needs a new name. It also needs to be Sign Up Sheet Sunday. And so, um, so that's what we're starting to call it, Sign Up Sheet Sunday. So Sign Up Sheets are available in church, and there's some over here as well. In church in particular, we have the Sign Up Sheets for um, Palm Sunday. Because if you remember, on Palm Sunday, we always read... Matthew, Mark, or Luke's account of the Passion Gospel, and we have parts. And some of them are very small, and some of them are rather more um, substantial. Um, so if you're available to take one of those parts, sign up the sheet, do note that you need to make sure you sign up for the 8 or the 1015 service, depending on which service you want to attend that day. Um, and then, of course, there are a lot of things happening that week. Monday, Thursday, we have kind of a, 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 a you know, potluck. The menu is a little bit funny because we do uh, we do uh, foods that Jesus and his disciples might have um, enjoyed uh, on the Passover meal they shared. Uh, we don't observe it as a Passover, um, but we do uh, sort of evoke some of that uh, that memory. Um, and that's Monday, Thursday. Uh, so there's there's food to bring, and then there's lots of different services with lots of different roles to fill. So uh, ushers and lectors, and, and especially if you haven't done that before, this is a chance for you to say, well, maybe I could try that on for size and see if it fits. So that's my thought. Uh, so I invite you to, uh, um, to do that. Uh, but as I said, today is daylight saving time, and so appropriately, uh, it turns out there's, there's, uh, there's something for us to note. All right. Thank you for indulging me. Uh, back, to, back to plan A. Dave, are you ready? <laughs> Can you follow that up? I'm going to follow that up. <laughs> <laughs> That wasn't very fair, was it? <laughs> Hi, Dave. Welcome. Gosh, thanks, Jim. <laughs> hey, good morning, everybody. Um, I did a variation of the same topic a couple years ago, so Jed and I thought it might be time to revisit it. Uh, for those of you who don't know, 
my background, I spent about 23 years doing trust and estate planning and investment management for high net worth individuals all over the country for key bank. And then I spent about 12, 14 years before that managing nonprofits. So I've spent my whole career trying to get money away from people, <laughs> which is a challenge always. Um, so today we're going to review some of the estate planning things I talked about uh, a couple years ago. Talk about charitable giving and the good old 2017 tax law that um, has caused a lot of concern in the uh, estate planning and charitable giving community. So I'll tell you where I, my opinion of that and where I think we should all kind of put that. So, you know, as Jed started out with that, I got to start out with a good quote too. So some of you may be familiar with, some may not, there's a, there's a legal term called, it's referred to as an, oh. <laughs> <laughs> all right. And Gail, I, you probably never dealt with interim clauses when you were doing your high-end legal work, but that's the type of thing where someone gets mad at their kid, and they say, if you do anything to challenge my will, you get a dollar. Um, I've seen some in documents. They always make for interesting discussions with the family. So this is my favorite interim clause. This one is from the 11th century. He that bereaves my will, which by God's permission I have now made, let him be bereaved of these earthly joys. <laughs> and may the Almighty Lord cut him off from all holy men's communion and doomsday. <laughs> and he be delivered to Satan, the devil, and all his cursed companion, to hell's bottom, and there be tortured with whom God has cast off, forsaken, without intermission, and never trouble my ears. <laughs> I challenge any attorney in this day and age to do better than that. I'm not gonna challenge that bill. No. <laughs> so, basic estate planning documents. Uh, this is a subject of, of discussion among a lot of people, but basically my top four are, and then I've added another one, are a will or a trust, a durable power of attorney, and we'll go back in a second, a medical power of attorney, an advanced directive, then we get down to community property agreements and post forms. When I started in the business, in the trust business in 1990, there seemed to be this perception among attorneys that everybody needed a living trust. That has sort of gone away. The big, the big living trust for a lot of cases were a sales tool. There were companies that we referred to and referred to as the business as trust factories, and their only job was to have everyone do a living will, I mean a living trust. The problem turned out to be that a lot of people didn't handle their living trust correctly. They didn't fund them, so at the time they died, they still had to go through probate, which was sort of the reason to not do them. I saw Juan Don for a couple whose net worth was maybe about $150,000, which was their house and a, a small savings account. Ridiculous, just a waste of money. What we do know is there are some cases where a will is really what you need because your estate needs to go through probate, and those would be the cases where you think there's gonna be some contention going on. Because corporate trustees like I was, we don't do arguments. We look at the eight and a half by 11 and if eight and a half 11 says X, we do X. We don't interpret. So if families know there's gonna be some dissension, there's gonna be some argument, it's better to have that man or the woman wearing the big black robe with that stick in their hand, slamming it down, going parties over. So there are advantages to a will. The big complaint about wills was about you had to go through probate and it takes so long and blah, 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 blah. There are some states, for example, and I won't ask people to raise hands, but anyone who moved here from California, I can guarantee you they have a, a trust. The reason they have a trust in California is probate is such a horrible experience in California and so expensive that nobody wants to go through it. I dealt with a situation once, well actually we had a client who dealt with a situation. 
he was an extremely successful anesthesiologist from the Bay Area who'd grown up in Vancouver, Canada, moved back to Vancouver, Canada after he and his wife retired. His brother, who lived in California, died. He was named as the executor of his brother's estate. He came to me one day and he said, Dave, look at this letter. I'm going, sure, I'll look at the letter. So it was a letter from the Superior Court in whatever county it was in California saying, I said, okay, give me the background on this letter. Well, as the executor in California, you get a legislatively mandated percentage of the estate as your fee, just like the attorneys do. And he needed more money, like a hole in the head. And he said, I don't want this money. He wrote the court a very nice letter saying, I don't want this money. I want it to go to my brother's kids. He got the letter back from the court saying, too bad, so sad. The law says it's yours. You deal with it. If you want to give it to them, that's up to you, and you can pay the gift tax. <laughs> so in some states, everyone has trust. Oregon, Washington, not so much. Probate is a process that just takes time. And as I tell people, if a trust is, per is correctly administered, it should take about the same amount of time. Oregon and Washington have both passed statutes now that there's always been what's called a creditor's claim period for wills. And you'll see them published in the paper. You know, Joe Jones died, I'm the attorney. You get till X date to turn in any bills after that, we're not going to pay us. They both have that same type of law now for trusts, which I started in the business, didn't exist. So you should take time. I was telling somebody in my I had just been in the trust business not very long, and we had had a living trust. The last trustor died. We distribute the assets to the kids. About three months later, we get a, bill, a very large bill from a legitimate creditor after we distributed the money. We had to go back to the heirs and say, give us the money back. They were not happy campers. <laughs> so durable power of attorney. So, Powers of attorney, again, when I started in the business, the durable power of attorney and the healthcare power of attorney were all one document. But tradi excuse me, traditionally now, most attorneys will divide them up and do a durable power of attorney that controls financial affairs and gifting and blah, blah, so on and so forth, and then a medical power of attorney. Many times I've seen where who's ever writing the document of whoever it's for will choose different people on each, on each side. They may have one child who's going to be the financial power of attorney under the durable power and another one who's going to do the medical decisions because they know the first one, if it comes down to pulling the plug or something, would never do it. Um, important thing that we've all, I think you've all probably heard of HIPAA. HIPAA was a great idea that's gone berserk uh, when the government did it. Um, we used to, in the early years, I used to be able to call Dr. Lear up and say, Dr. Lear, I think Gay Lawson's going south faster than she's going north. <laughs> and, uh, and they'd say, whew, you think so? Yeah, yeah, probably. After HIPAA passed, a doctor would say, who? And you're who? So HIPAA has had some problems. but. A good medical power of attorney has to have good HIPAA language that says this person is my designee for health care decisions. Advanced directives are, you know, artificial, do you want artificial hydration, uh, do not resuscitate order. Oregon has something called, a, I'm going to jump over community property agreements for a second. Oregon has something called a post form which a lot of you may be familiar with. It's a pink form that you fill out with your doctor that says what you want done. I had heard about post forms, but in another part of my life, uh, a lot of you know I think that I volunteer for search and rescue. And as part of the medical team for search and rescue, we have to do two ride-alongs a year with Ben Fire um, in their uh, medic rigs. The first thing they look for if we go into a house and a person is not communicating and is having problems, the first thing we look for is a post form. It's either on their refrigerator, it's in their, the other two places you look is on their refrigerator, and it's not on the refrigerator, you look in the freezer. Because those, <laughs> literally, those are the two places they tell people to put them. Put them in the freezer or in a Ziploc bag. 
Um, but post forms are, that's what they're going to look for in Oregon. You also have to remember, in just about every state in the United States, if you call 911 and they come, and someone's sitting there saying, well, my dad's got a do not resuscitate order, and the fireman goes, where is it? If you can't give it to them, liability-wise, they have to try to treat the person, which may be exactly opposite what the person wants. So have a pulse form, have it clear, have people know what it says and where it is. Community property agreements, Carol and I moved from Washington, which is a community property state. Everyone in Washington has a community property agreement. Everyone from California has a community property agreement. Oregon has sort of taken the middle road on this. Oregon is a what they legally refer to as a quasi-community property state, in that if you community property agreements are not required in the state of Oregon, but if you have one, the Oregon courts will honor it. So it's kind of a, a middle of the road situation. So everybody should have you know these four documents a will or a trust durable power of attorney medical power of attorney advanced directive question mark and a post form someone was asking me you know like i said if you know your estate's going to be contentious you should have a will probably because i as a trust officer i'm not going to argue with your kids like I said, if it's an eight and a half by 11 and it doesn't say Johnny can have a, a, a new Porsche, Johnny ain't getting a new Porsche, okay? And I've had kids try to, I didn't have one for a Porsche, I had one that tried to get us to buy him a, a new vet, and we said, nah, it's not written here, sorry. <laughs> but there are cases where a trust is appropriate. Um, I was talking to someone earlier this week, single person, no family, Who's going to take care of things? Who's going to divide things? That's the, excuse me. That's the kind of case where a living trust is appropriate. Interestingly, you know, over 60% of the people of the year die with none of these documents. Well, a lot of them we don't don't need them, but a lot of people also die what's referred to as intestate. In other words, you're dying without a will. Every state in the country has intestacy statutes. And intestacy statutes show if you don't have a will, where is your money going? Or where is your stuff going? In the, probably about 2000, 2001, I was working in a key bank office in Bellevue, Washington. And one of my coworkers <coughs> asked me to call her client, who was a senior executive at um, Amazon. So I called because she said she's worth a lot of money and she's got no will. And I'm like, okay, I'll give her a call. So I called this woman and I said, uh, you know, this person asked me to call, blah, 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 so on and so forth. And I said, she was kind of concerned because you don't have a will. She said, yeah, I don't have a will. And I said, well, can you tell me why you don't have a will? She said, my parents, I've put money, give my parents enough money, my brother's a deadbeat, I don't want to get him to get any money. And I said, well, who do you think, who do you want your money to go to? And she said, I wanted to go to my goddaughter who lives in France. And I said, oh, well, with no will, how do you think that's going to happen? She says, well, that's what I want to have happen. And I'm going, okay, great, well, that's what you want, but it's not going to work that way. So I went, I had a friend who was an attorney who took the Washington intestacy statutes and he titled it, the state of Washington has a will for you. And he used to give it out to people. So I got that out and I took a red pen, circled the whole thing and said, find your goddaughter in France on this list. She called me the next day and says, now what was that estate planning attorney's name? <laughs> so, basic estate planning stuff. David? Yes? I just want to ask about the Pulse form. Yeah. <clears throat> in retirement homes, they put it in uh, the back of the bathroom door. So if I were to go into my neighbor's home, I wouldn't look in the freezer. Well, it, that's, 
All I can tell you, Joan, is that's what they say when I was working with the guys at Ben Fire. The, those are the places they look, because that's what a lot of people have been told. They either look on the refrigerator, both the ones I found were hooked on magnets to the refrigerator, but they said the other place is in the freezer, because that's where some people in some seminars have told them to put them. And it's a place in your RV is to put it in the freezer. Really? So, huh. Just curious. here's one that's, that I find again and again, and I found causes more problems, beneficiary designations. <coughs> Everyone who has any of these items has had to list a beneficiary at some point. In other words, who do you want to get the money, or who, who are the multiple people you want to get the money? But people don't keep these up to date. They don't keep the beneficiary designations up to date. I was working with a doctor and his wife who was retiring, and we looked at his retirement plan. His kids were in their late 20s, early 30s, and he still had his brother to act as the guardian for his kids. I'm going, really? Oh, he said, I guess I haven't looked at it in a few years, have I? And I'm going, really? Yeah, good. Another thing to understand about beneficiary designation. One is items and des with de beneficiary designations passed outside of probate. So you have a will, it's going through probate. That stuff doesn't get probated. Okay? This is the most important part. If you don't get it right, don't expect the courts to jump in and help you. Courts are very wary to question beneficiary designations on documents. It's just not been a, a winning proposition. This was a great case probably about eight years ago now. Kennedy versus DuPont. Mr. Kennedy had spent his career working for DuPont. Mr. Kennedy and his, what we're guessing, you don't really find this in the court documents very clearly. Mr. Kennedy and we think it was his second wife got a divorce. <clears throat> As part of the divorce, the second Mrs. Kennedy was supposed to give up all rights to his retirement plans. When you go through a divorce, there's something if you're doing retirement plans, and this doesn't apply to IRAs, only qualified retirement plans, there's something called a QDRO, which stands for a Qualified Domestic Relations Order. And that is an order that's put together, approved by the judge, that's sent to a trustee of a retirement plan that says, hey, here's how we're dividing Joe's retirement plan. Or Mrs. Joe has agreed that she doesn't get any of Joe's retirement plan. But they have to be done in a very specific way. So when the Kennedys got divorced, an attorney put together a qualified domestic relations order. It was sent to DuPont. DuPont says this isn't correct. It doesn't cut it. And the attorney never did anything to change it. So. The second Mrs. divorced Mrs. Kennedy was still named as the beneficiary of one of his retirement plans. Mr. Kennedy dies. His daughter from his first marriage was the executor of, her, of his estate. She calls DuPont and says, I want my dad's retirement plan. Uh, and DuPont says, sorry, you're not listed. His ex-wife is. She said, but the court, they went to court, they got divorced. The court says she wasn't supposed to get anything. This went all the way to the US Supreme Court. Now, any of you that know anything about Supreme Court is Supreme Court decisions are usually like five judges on one side and four on the other, six and three maybe, seven and two. This was nine to nothing yeah. saying, hey, listen. Sorry, but we can only require administrators to do what their document says they're supposed to do. And administrators at DuPont had done what they were supposed to do. So she didn't get that money. <clears throat> Interesting sidelight on that case was that in looking through the documents, he had changed the benefit. He had like two retirement, different retirement plans at DuPont. He had changed the beneficiary designation on one, 
but not on the other. So a lot of commentators said, he did that on purpose. That wasn't an accident. Another one along that line that was very interesting in the state of Washington was, and I was kind of tangentially involved in this one, was we had a client in Tacoma who died, and I was working with the people down there on some other things. And his wife came in and said, my husband died. I know he has an IRA here. I want the funds. So I was in the office that day, and the, someone came and looked at me and said, look at this. And I'm going, hey, this is your issue, not mine. <laughs> the beneficiary designation of his IRA listed his mistress of like 25 years. <laughs> that one ended up in court. <laughs> so beneficiary designations, make sure they're not only, uh, you've looked at them recently, but make sure they're really going to the people you want to give them to. You know, your kids are older, you want to give them to grandkids, something like that. 2017 tax law and you and me, some great tax quotes. From Robert Heinlein, be wary of strong drink and make, make you shoot at the tax collector and miss. <laughs> Twain, the only difference between the tax man and the tax is the tax dermis leaves your skin. <laughs> and this is my favorite. Will Rogers, the only difference between death and taxes is that death doesn't get worse every time Congress meets. <laughs> so, there was great hoopla about this year's tax uh, changes. The biggest one for most of us as individuals is the standard deduction has been basically doubled. So what that's going to mean, according to a lot of commentators, is that less and less of us are going to have to itemize our taxes. So married filing jointly is up now to t from 12,700 to 24,000. Individuals, 6350 to 12000 So unless you have more than that many charitable and other deductions, you're just, you're just going to take the standard deduction now, which is going to make life easier for some people. Estate taxes, the exemption has gone on from $11 million for, I mean, gone up to $11 million for individuals and $22 million for married couples. I, as I added there with proper estate planning. Here's the catcher in Oregon and Washington is. The Oregon exemption is only a million dollars. So you may not owe any, so there's a space as you see between 11, 1 million and 11 million. <laughs> so in that $10 million space, you may owe the state of Oregon estate taxes, but not the feds. All these provisions sunset in 2025, if they're not made permanent by then, and if not, everything goes back to 2017 levels. So again, we're depending on our politicians to either make this permanent before 2025, or we get to roll back to 2017. The reason I wanted to include this specific information, um, we didn't talk about this last time, is there's been a great deal of discussion raised in many quarters that the increase um, exemption is going to reduce people's amount of charitable giving to churches, to schools, to whatever else, because they don't get the charitable tax deduction for it anymore. Some research that was done in the 2000s, and as I remember this was done at Yale, mm -hmm. that the charitable tax deduction was for the vast majority of people, not the reason they supported organizations. The main reasons were a personal connection, a belief in the mission, and wanting to sustain the organization. So, I, 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 had, I knew a guy who was the director of planned giving at University of Washington. In fact, his brother and I used to work together, and I think his brother is now the head of planned giving over at the farm in Corvallis. Um, but, when he was at University of Washington, somebody came in and said, I want to give a million dollars to the University of Washington. And he'd want to know what their motivation was. Because if he thought they were just doing it for a tax dodge, 
he'd been caught in a position where someone wanted to do a planned gift for a million dollars. They were going to give the money over the years. They gave like the first chunk, got the tax deduction, were never seen from again. So he said, are you really committed to the University of Washington? I'm going, well, that's a hard statement to answer yes to, but I don't, <laughs> I don't know. So, uh, you know, and this is a rhetorical question. I don't expect anyone to raise their hand. How many of you strongly consider tax advantage when choosing your organizations to support? I know I don't. I, I mean, it's sort of like politicians running for office. You've never been able to take that off your taxes, but a lot of us are stupid enough we still support them. So. <laughs> Charitable giving. Dave does not speak on behalf of the institution. <laughs> <laughs> Comments made belong to <laughs> That's right. Okay. So charitable giving. You know, Aristotle said, to give money away is easy in any man's power. To decide whom to give it to and how large and when and for what purpose and how is neither in every man's power nor an easy matter. And this one I sort of added in because it's, it's sort of my own personal mantra, the service you give to God and your fellow man is the rent you pay for the time you spend on earth. I've seen that attributed to about 45 different people, so I don't know. So I just put unknown up there. So, charitable giving. Um, I think it's a challenge for a lot of people. Who do you give it to? Do you give it to your family members, friends, charities? When do you give it? During life or at death? And how to give it? Do you give cash or other assets? Do you give it straight out or do you give it in trust? for organizations. During life, and this is a problem we used to address with people quite a bit, um, especially um, we were in, I was in a situation once where I actually told someone, in this case it was their son, I told him to leave my office and never come here asking for any of your father's money again. Father had Alzheimer's, uh, we were controlling the whole thing, and this child just kept asking for money and asking for money and asking for money, and it was depleting the parents' assets to a point that we weren't comfortable. So, only give what you can live without. Uh, I was working with a woman once who had three children, and she was work we were, I was helping her work on her will. And she had one child who, as I remember, was a kind of a mid-level business executive. Another one was a very competent craftsman. I think he was a plumber, made good money. And she had a third child who was a daughter who taught, uh, this woman came from a very strong Catholic family. Her daughter taught in an inner city Catholic school in Detroit. And she said, she's never gonna make any money. She's fabulous at what she does she's going to need more than the other two. And I said, you know, it's not written. You have to treat everybody equally. You just need to treat them fairly. And if your opinion, that third daughter needs more money, that's what you should do. So we had that discussion with a lot of people. Give the assets away that make the most sense for you and the giftee. There is when I talk about estate tax, there's also gift tax. And if you give away so much money, you've got to start paying gift tax. But I knew some people who would give their maximum gift tax amount before they had to start paying gift tax away because they may, in one case, it was someone who had a building in Seattle that was highly appreciated and they knew it was just going to keep going up in value and they wanted, they wanted to, going to give it to their kids at some point, and they wanted to do it when they could cap the gift tax, you know, that they were going to have to pay. So they paid the gift tax, got it out of their estate. Structures of gift taxes, the maximum advantage. There are things, and we can talk about them at a later date probably more, um, that I've had people use very successfully called char charitable remainder, and annuity trust. They use their IRA. Um, or other retirement plan for gifting. I worked with one gentleman to set up a charitable remainder trust. <coughs> this gentleman, I had mentioned to some people before, he had made the decision, he had one daughter, 
came from a very successful family in Seattle, ran a very successful business. He was like the third generation running this business, which was unusual because most, by the time most businesses get to the third generation, there's nothing left of them. But he was giving 95% of his estate to one charity in Seattle and 5% to his daughter. And I, I always, I'm always interested in people's motivation for doing things. So I said, oh, that's really interesting, but how did you come to that decision? You wanted to give 95% to this one charity and 5% to your daughter. And he was, it was his second marriage, so I mean, it was to take care of his wife and then to give away. And he said, listen, I paid for her to get a master's degree. I bought her house, the house she and her husband and family live in. I've set enough money aside for my two grandchildren to pay for them to go through college. And I've set her up in business. He said, that's enough. He said, I want to do other things with my money. So the way his estate was set up, it was at the time he died, everything was going to this one charity. And I said to him, you know, that's great. And they're going to say really nice things about you. But you know what else? You're going to be dead, and you're not going to hear him saying the nice things. So, so wouldn't you like to hear him say some nice things about you now? So he had a building in Seattle that his business, he owned it personally, and it had been in the family, and he inherited that he really was kind of an albatross for him because it was just a hassle. I mean, it was always rented, but he didn't want to deal with it anymore, and it was highly appreciated. So I said, why don't we put that, that building in this charitable remainder trust, we sell it out of the charitable remainder trust, the charitable beneficiary is the same charity you're going to give all your money to, and we can tell them. They don't need to know about the rest of the money, but we'll tell them about this piece of money that they're going to get income from every year. Then they'll say all nice sorts of nice things about you, and you'll be alive to hear them. <laughs> So we thought that was a pretty cool idea. Yeah. So that was it um, at, uh, when you're alive. <clears throat> at death, people make various bequests, maybe a charitable bequest of a specific bequest, i.e. $10,000 to Trinity Episcopal Church. More. More. $100,000 to Trinity Episcopal Church. A year. A year. <laughs> Jeez. They may make what's referred to as a remainder bequest. Remainder bequests usually come in the form of, I want you to do this, I want you to do that, and anything that's left goes to this person. Okay? So they're usually referred to as a rest, residue, and remainder type of gift. Then there's the ultimate beneficiary. And this is one that we used to talk to people about a lot that a lot of people miss out on or don't think about. And it doesn't happen very often. But most people are going to name their spouse, going to name their kids. So our discussion used to go something like this. Okay, what if you're traveling with your family and you all go down in the same airplane? Who's going to get the money then? And a lot of people never think about that, and they never add that in. So you make provisions for your wife, your kids, your grandkids, but what happens if none of those people are still around, or you outlive them all? Another thing you can do is name a charity as the beneficiary of your IRA or other retirement plan. Again, as I said, important to select the assets that are best to meet your needs and re the uh, recipient. Do you want to give them cash? Do you want to give them investment assets, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, so on and so forth? Do you want to give them real property, collectibles, arts, antiques, or stamp collection? Um, or an IRA? Oops, excuse me. Consider splitting the IRA with living and charitable beneficiaries. And my answer is down at the bottom. If you're giving the gift potentially to a um, charity, please do, them, do yourself and them a favor 
and discuss it with them, what you're thinking about giving them, because it may be something they don't want or can't use. It's not going to fit into their mission. They don't want, I mean, and they're also now, because of changes in the statutes, because of people abusing them so badly, there are really this type of stuff and real property values are really being questioned by the IRS. You know, that piece of dirt you want to give somebody that you say worth $5 million, you better have a good appraisal showing it's worth $5 million. They don't want to be in the position of having to refuse gifts. Uh, I haven't been in the position, but I know I have friends that are, are in the charitable, you know, business of universities and so on, who've actually had to go to court and say, we don't want it, we're not going to take it, and that doesn't make anybody happy, <laughs> and it's not a good thing for anybody. IRAs um, are getting to be a bigger and bigger portion of people's estates um, as time goes on. I remember when I started in the trust business, if an IRA was worth $250,000, like in 1990, dang. That one person had done something really well, and they'd done it right. <clears throat> By the time I retired in 2013, seeing retired business executives and, and physicians and dentists and attorneys and accountants with two and three million dollar IRAs was not out of the question. Um, and so what some people would do is they may take their IRA and instead of naming a charitable beneficiary as a beneficiary of their regular IRA, because that causes all sorts of potential problems for everybody involved, is they may split a portion off. So they'll open a new IRA and tell their IRA custodian, hey, I want to be start a new IRA and make XYZ the charity um, as the beneficiary of that IRA. We also had clients, I worked with a guy down in Medford, who actually took his IRA, he had four kids, no three, three sons, and split it into three portions. <coughs> so IRA one beneficiary was John, Joe, Sammy. So they each had their own IRA. But one of his sons was a very successful orthopedic surgeon in Beverly Hills. <laughs> Is that surprising? Successful? <laughs> Um, and so he had all of the fees for the IRA come out of the IRA that he created for the son who was the orthopedic surgeon. Figure he didn't need as much money as his brothers. So qualified charitable distribution actually was first passed as legislation in about 2006. And it was supposedly a way for people to use their IRAs to make charitable distributions to charities of their choice without going through all sorts of other faulty role. So it was good in 2006. Then they said it was okay in 2007, 2008. We didn't find out that it was good for 2007 until about February. And so this just kept going. We were never sure every year if it was going to be good or not good. And in 2014, they finally made it as good legislation, so it's around. So, any of you who are in the stage, so you're over 70 and a half, and every year you have to take a required minimum distribution from your IRA because that's the rule. Uncle Sam says that I don't care how big your IRA gets until you're 70 and a half, you don't have to pay any taxes on it, there's no capital gains involved if you make big money off stock or other investments, but by the time you're, se by the time you're 70 and a half, you have to start taking money out of it. Now the way the law actually reads is you don't have to start taking money out until the April 1st, following the year you turn 70 and a half. That turns out to be problematic, and I'm not going to go into all the details, but basically then what you're going to have to do, you're going to have to take out two distributions in one year. So 
when you start taking out RMDs, it comes out to you as taxable income every year. So it's just added to your taxes. Now, this is much easier than it used to be. When I started doing IRAs, the IRS had multiple tables that you had to make. I mean, it was just horrible deciding every year how much money people had to take out. Now, there are only three tables out there for IRAs. One is for mo all of us that, you know, or most of us, what you have to take out every year, and it's a factor. So at 1231 of every year, your IRA custodian or trustees looks and says how much you have. They divide it by that factor, and they said, how do you want it? You want it daily, monthly, quarterly, or in one lump sum? Because they have to get it out to you, and then you're going to get a 1099-R from them at the end of the year, saying that money came out of your IRA. The three, the three tables now, like I said, one is called the universal table, and that's what most of us use. And in the first year, the factor is 27.4. So that's what your IRA trustee is going to use to divide by how much you had at the end of the year. So it's about 4% the first year, let's say. There's another table if you and your spouse are more than 10 years apart in age you can use. And then another one if someone inherits an IRA. I had one, worked with one once who woman lived next door to this very nice family. She passed away. She made their three-year-old daughter the beneficiary of her IRA. So we had to go way down on the table to get that. <laughs> so basically what happens is every year your IRA trustee or your IRA custodian is going to send you a check uh, in some way, right? So if you want to give money to charity, so here's the money coming out. It comes down to you. You pay income tax on it, and then you give the money to charity and get a charitable deduction. It's that simple, right? Here's how it works under a qualified charitable deduction. <clears throat> if you're over 70 and a half, you call your IRA custodian and you say, I want to give $30,000 to Trinity. Okay? So your IRA custodian, whoop, here's Trinity. They give them, but they send the check directly to Trinity. We stop, we miss the point of you having to pay income tax on it, okay? But you also miss the part of being able to take the charitable deduction. But especially with this new legislation of the taxes where you're not going to take the charitable deduction anyway, you might as well miss the place of having to pay the tax on it and give it and have your um, your IRA custodian do it. And you can give up to $100,000 a year to any um, anyone you want. To any or $100,000 a year total. I did miss one thing that I wanted to mention, so I think I might, um, let's see, where did I put it? Oh, cash or other assets. There is something that exists out there that many, some of you may be aware of called the annual exclusion amount. And the annual exclusion amount is how much can I give anybody in a year and not have to pay taxes on it. That number this year, for the first time in like five years, has gone up, so it's now $15,000 a year. So you can give as many people as you want $15,000 a year and not have to pay a state tax. The exception to that which is really good, I think, for a lot of, for maybe for some of you, is you may have a grandchild that you want to pay their college tuition. So the way most people do it is they'll give the money to mom and dad and let mom and dad pay the, the tuition, right? Under the tax code, if you send, or medical bills, let's say, if you send that money directly to the institution, you can give more than the annual exclusion amount. Okay, just wanted to throw that out there also. Okay, so we talked about qualified charitable deductions. I think it's a great tool for people. Uh, I, it hasn't been used enough because it was so variable. No one knew if it was really going to exist or not. So that's it. Any questions? Like I said, I'm not an attorney and I don't charge an hourly for any friends. I have to work for a living. I don't get to practice. I had to get it right the first time. So.
Any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. If not, I think we got to go to church, right, Jen? Thank you. Stay.